In the weeks before KSP2's initial release into early access, I got the opportunity to sit down with creative director Nate Simpson to ask some questions about the then unreleased game and get his thoughts and insights into the game's development. Eight months has passed since then, and last week at Space Create Day 2023, Nate gave an extensive presentation detailing the game's first roadmap feature, adding the massive science update along with an array of bug fixes. And shortly after this reveal, I got another chance to have a sit down with the man to not only glean further information about the science update, but to also dig into some questions that I think many of us have been curious to have answered given the game's general state and its community's reception during its time in early access thus far. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Nate Simpson. I would like to add a disclaimer that I had some microphone issues. So Nate's microphone worked well, which is obviously good, but mine did not. So my audio will sound a bit weird. Apologies, but you know, the important audio, Nate, uh, is fine. So just getting that out of the way. So it's been a while since we last sat together like this. Was it Amsterdam? It was Amsterdam. Wow. Eight, eight months. Eight months ago. Wow. Is it eight months? Yeah. I wow. think 10 minus eight yeah. is two. So. There we go. There we go. Batting a thousand right out of the gate. <laughs> now, you'll have to forgive me. The viewers might not know kind of the timing of this interview versus what's happened, but you, about an hour ago maybe, just released the whole, revealed the whole science update news and everything. This December, we're releasing our first major roadmap update, which we're calling For Science. <laughs> I had lots of questions prepared that were written before this. So I've been frantically in the bar rewriting everything. So I might have to be like referring to my phone a bit. Okay. So just bear with me. But, you know, I would have been, it would have been a really good presentation on my part until, you know, you have to ruin it. Well, we do have an opportunity for you. I actually haven't heard what you thought of the presentation. Like, is, what's your feeling about it? Well, um, yeah, I'm excited. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it all kind of plays out, really. And I guess, you know, you have connections in the space industry. When is Starship going to launch again? Well, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer to that question right now, Matt, but I can tell you where to find thousands of high quality documentaries. This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream offers an exclusive treasure trove of award-winning and original documentary films, shows, and series that you won't find anywhere else. It's a world of knowledge right at your fingertips. I've been diving into their incredible library of content. From science and nature to history, technology, military history, music, food, and so much more, there really is something for everyone. But the best part? There's always something new to watch. CuriosityStream drops fresh content every single week, so you'll never run out of fascinating content to get stuck into. And whether you prefer to watch on your TV, computer, or mobile device, CuriosityStream has you covered. It's available on multiple devices, so you can enjoy your favorite content anytime, anywhere. And guess what? It's incredibly affordable, with plans starting at under $5 a month. But viewers of this channel get even better value. Use the promo code MATLOWN and you'll save 25% off. Just go to curiositystream.com slash MATLOWN or scan that QR code on screen to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. Sponsors like CuriosityStream help make all of this content possible, so big thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. So um, I'm kind of going to be asking the questions that I know the community are kind of quite keen for some clarification on. So the first one really was that you know, KSP2 was originally expected to be released as a complete game and not early access in 2020, I think was the original release year. Right. But obviously it's now in early access and even with the newly announced For Science update, it's still not quite feature par with KSP1. Can you share any insights into the factors that contributed to these delays in development? Yeah, um, well, definitely we've got a gap between uh, our estimates and reality. Um, sometimes that gap is pretty profound, and it's a conversation that we've been really pretty much always having across our team. One of the things I think we've realized is that when we are scoping tasks at the beginning of a process, um, they sometimes turn out to take a lot longer than we expected. That is somewhat to be expected with a game of this complexity. I know that I speak in very vague terms about, you know, this is a big and complex game. And, and maybe people think, okay, here goes Nate again with the big and complex game thing. 
um, and, and this would probably be a situation where having one of our engineers here with you as well would, would benefit us in terms of their being able to speak in detail about what it is that is so complicated about the game. But broadly speaking, um, we have incredibly intelligent, incredibly talented developers uh, who are very, very clever in the solutions they come up with, but sometimes we are m underestimating, sometimes by quite a, a huge margin, how long it'll take to get those tasks completed. In this case, it was nearly four years. In, in this case, it was nearly four years. And, and what's interesting about that is many features have been working to, at some percentage less than 100%. And, you know, having worked in games for 30 years now, um, this game, compared to almost any other game I've ever touched, has a, a, an almost perverse inclination to, to hide scope inside of tasks that may at, at first blush seem to be relatively finite. Um, so one of the big things that we've sort of been developing over the course of early access uh, is we've overhauled the, the team structure to some extent, where, where oftentimes things were a little bit driven from above by production. We have now moved to a feature team structure. Each feature team has a product owner, and th those feature teams are staffed by people. They're multidisciplinary, so you'll have a bunch of different people associated with the feature so that there's much less siloing and so that those groups can develop over time a very intimate understanding of the systems for which they are responsible. It's a much more ground up approach rather than from above. And I, I think the results to some extent show in what is present in the first science update. I know some of that progress was hidden, right? Because by virtue of what we were doing, they had to kind of work a little bit in secret for a while. And it looked from the outside like our velocity was lower than it really was. Um, but to circle back to your original question, we've released footage of us playing multiplayer, building colonies. Like we've, we've, we've had times where those features were quote unquote working, where I could sit down with the game and play with it. But the distance between partial and full functionality was in some cases quite, quite wide. So we're trying, well, I think we're actually succeeding at uh, managing our expectations for how long it'll take to make a feature, I think we're doing a lot better now than we had in the past. Um, but it's definitely, I totally understand the frustration that people feel, especially given the emphasis of our uh, promotion of the game. We're showing all this future stuff, colonies, interstellar, multiplayer, and then we release with a game that, is, that, that doesn't even have re-entry heating, you know, let alone even a progression mode. Um, I, I fully understand why that would be disappointing, and I think it, it manifests, especially within our community, because people are as passionate about it as they are. You know, sometimes there's, there's unhappiness about the state of the game. So, yeah, I, I'm glad that we're starting to do better in that area. I'm really looking forward to the For Science update because it is going to show rather than tell, right? It doesn't put me in yet another position of, painting a, a, a word picture for people, and then they're like, okay, fine. Because from the very beginning, actually, our meta goals have not changed. And to some extent, my role over the past several years has been to continue to communicate both inside the team and to the public what the strategy is, what the goals are, what it is we're building, why I want to get out of bed in the morning, is because I want to make a terrestrial colony and make a rover that extracts the resources and bring it back and set it on an automatic delivery route that's what I'm waiting for. That's what I want to experience. And I do think I need to keep repeating that, even if it's not, if it's not working today. Uh, that is part of my job. But again, there are consequences to my becoming overly passionate about the game's future progress. I understand that. I'm trying to do better. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's perfect. Um, as people have responded that they've been putting off playing early access until the science update. I sort of saw these comments on social media right mm -hmm. after your speech. Uh, so clearly a lot of hope is resting on this update delivering. Yes. How confident are you that fans won't be disappointed and this milestone will allow KSP2 to come part of KSP1 or even mm -hmm. surpass it? So uh, those kinds of comparisons with KSP1 are tricky because KSP-1 is an accumulation of features that have arrived over many, many years. And so like IVA cockpits, uh, EVA parachutes, 
there are so many beautiful, cool little things that are going to take time to arrive in KSP2. So I, I worry about that sort of like parity comparison. But what I do believe is that the For Science update turns it into a proper game with a long form progression that requires multiple sessions. I have seen within our team us all falling back in love with the game, remembering what it was like to play those long form progressions back in KSP1. People who are new to, there, there are some people on our team who are relatively new to Kerbal Space Program, watching them fall in love with it for the first time and understand, oh right, this is why this is a game you can't put down and, and really kind of coming back to that feeling. Based on that, I feel pretty confident. I, I think uh, we're in a pretty good position. So I, I can't wait to see how people respond. This next question I know is sort of skirting on what you can't talk about because of employee confidentiality. Sure. We understand that. But we all kind of understand that KSP2 lost its technical director upon launch, basically. Does the game have a new technical director now? Yes, it does. It does? Yeah. Perfect. And I'm assuming you can't talk about why the previous director... I, I can't speak to that kind of personnel stuff. Okay. I, I would highlight that um, turnover at game companies is a thing. I've, I've heard, I don't know if this is a fact, that, that the average for the industry is around two years per person. Um, I, we're pretty proud of the fact that our turnover is lower than that. So uh, I think the people that are on our team are by and large pretty happy. And, and yeah, our new, uh, our new engineering director is a very nice fellow. I like him a lot. This fear might be somewhat quelled by the latest science reveal, but over the course of early access, concerns have arisen about KSP2's future development with a lot of players fearing it's going to get soft cancelled uh, before it's completed. So how could you reassure the player community that the game will be fully developed and you know, continue receiving significant roadmap features? Um, I think the most obvious fact about this game's community is how uh, passionate it is. Um, and, you know, sometimes that passion registers in positive ways, sometimes it registers in negative ways, sometimes it registers as worry in this case. Um, and the, the only time I would be concerned about this game's future is if the community went silent, right? If I heard crickets, then I would probably be worried for my job. But I don't. And when we signed up for this game, when we started working on it, all the way up through the label, all the way up through Private Division, we understood that this was a long tail uh, project, right? We know that there's a market. We know that people are very, very excited about it. We hear people say all the time that they're waiting for such and such a feature. In some cases, it is the arrival of science progression. Um, so we, we know that there's a market, but we also recognize that the, the game has a long way to go. And yeah, it, it, there's, we're not gonna get canceled. I, I mean, if that's the, uh, does soft canceled mean like they just slowly decrease the budget over time or something? More that we hear radio silence and then a Twitter post is made or X post is made yeah. saying development is not going to continue. Oh no, yeah, so uh, if yeah. that's happening, I don't know about it. <laughs> that would be like, you know, these live service games that right. promise years of development and then six months later it says nothing, nothing it's not going to continue. Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's much chance of that. I mean, it, I have seen no signs of it at any rate. Okay. Um, it seems kind of apparent from data mining and the you know, original KSP developer updates prior to release that many parts of the game you know, that aren't in the current public build, like you mentioned, multiplayer and colonies, uh, exist to an extent, sometimes quite you know, extensively, uh, to the point where many kind of are postulating that the plan was never to release in early access, but um, the move to release in early access was kind of a last minute thing and potentially came from orders beyond the immediate KSP2 kind of directors. Do you have any comment to make on that? Uh, I mean, I can't speak to the timing of the decision because I don't really remember the timing of the decision. It wasn't literally the last minute. That would be probably impossible because you need a certain amount of preparation to, to, um, to decide to do early access. Um, I do know that when we made the decision to go to early access, it was done because there was utility. Um, there was a perception that Number one, we were having fun playing the game in that state. Perhaps I was falling too in love with procedural wings, but I, I, I was playing it every night and making crazier and crazier airplanes and saying, I've never had this experience in KSP1, this is so much fun. And a lot of us were kind of having that experience with the game. 
and also recognizing that the long-term health of the game would be improved by getting community feedback early and often. Uh, and despite the fact that it has had, um, you know, some people have been frustrated with the apparent pace of progress, um, we've learned a lot. And in fact, we've even improved, you know, on the QA side, we've got that curb system and, and the bug reporting, and we've spun up the pioneers group. There are some, now a, a few people who are actually really beginning to do deep testing on the game. And just our processes for quality, our processes for testing, our processes across the board have been improving because we have put ourselves in this position where we've got lots of people looking at it all the time. So this wasn't like publisher intervention, the move to early access? I, I'm not even sure that, the, I mean, when we're talking about the publisher, like take two, I, I'm not sure that they had a strong opinion either way. I, I think they're, they're huge and they live in the sky. Fair enough. Intercept is reportedly working on another game alongside Kerbal Space Program 2. This is true. Will this simultaneous development affect the progress of Kerbal Space Program 2, or is there a separate team assigned to this other game? The latter. It is a separately funded, separately staffed project. Because I think you've said, not necessarily in this interview, but in previous kind of statements, KSP2 has roughly 50, I know you have it outside contractors and things, so it's hard to put an exact number. So that 50 is for KSP2, That's it's right. not split across multiple games. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is funny because I've been asked so many times today, how many people are actually working on KSP2? I'm going to come to the next one of these like with an, a very specific <laughs> number. Uh, I, I do think about 50 is accurate. Uh, that there ha we are not pulling people off of KSP2 to put them on this other project if, if that's the concern. Okay. So bug fixes in KSP2 are obviously appreciated um, and obviously many bugs do exist after eight months though we are glad to see that the science update seems to address kind of a great many of these bugs. Can you say kind of or clarify whether most developers are focused on roadmaps versus only a few are fixing bugs or if most are fixing bugs and if you're assigned to future features? This is a very hard question to answer in part because a person is never fully assigned to one or the other. And this is another question that I've been hearing a fair amount recently. Um, I, I, have, I have heard it said that there is an ideal balance that I do not know we have achieved of spending 70% of your engineering bandwidth paying down tech debt and working on foundational stuff and 30% working on features. Um, I think that is aspirational. I think, and again, this is coming from the creative director. I am not a producer and I'm not an engineer. And there's probably someone on my team who's watching this who's just screaming silently at their, at their screen um, that, it's, that it's probably closer to 50-50. Um, but again, a, a lot of that stuff is really just contingent on what are the primary problems we're trying to solve today and how foundational are they? As, you know, especially in the early part of early access, it, you're, you're working on systems that have many other dependencies. You have to fix them first and they're in some cases unglamorous, right? It's, it doesn't necessarily translate to a super punchy item on, on the change list for that particular update. Um, but it has to be done for all these other dependent systems to work properly. Um, so uh, I, I would say, if I had to guess, as a non-specialist, um, that, that over time, as those foundational things become more stable and the architecture becomes cleaner, and also the teams involved become more experienced, that things will tend to shift more in the direction of feature development which is why, again, not making any hard predictions here, uh, I, I would expect that the turnaround for future roadmap updates will be significantly compressed relative to the amount of time it took between launch and the first of the roadmap updates. Okay, great. It's no secret that at least a part of the community are uh, somewhat out for blood. <laughs> uh, I know they've been digging through like LinkedIn posts and job listings, which I think you might be aware of as well. Um, is the community's kind of, you know, lust for blood kind of having an effect on the morale of the developer team? Um, an effect on the morale of the team. We want people to be happy. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've had this conversation a few times where, uh, you know, I'm reminding both myself and the people around me that people care so much about this game. 
And it's, it's easy for me to relate to because, you know, I'm giving years of my life to this game. This is my life's ambition to make this game great. Um, and I, I understand. Uh, it, is, it is not, uh, you know, it, the fact that people, some people are upset. I don't know that I would necessarily say the whole community uh, feels exactly the same way. I think there's been a little bit of a, a phenomenon of because there hasn't been too much news of any kind to say nothing of good news um, that to pass the time you know there's been increased speculation and, and increased doubt and you know perhaps an erosion of trust i understand why that's happening i don't know that there's anything we can do to address the issue other than make the game great let let the first science update do the talking for us I believe that a lot of those people who are expressing frustration right now, once they have the game in their hands, once they're actually having fun, once their rocket's not a wobbly noodle, um, that wobbly rockets, eh? <laughs> that yeah, I mean, once we've once we've achieved that, that a lot of those people will come around. I don't think they this. Well, I don't know. I won't speak to all of them. I don't think it's necessarily hatred for me. It's frustration about the situation. And hopefully we can show them, we can demonstrate that we are trustworthy stewards of a very important franchise. You sort of answered my final question really, was that was that rebuilding trust with the community is pretty crucial and how you do intend to regain the trust of the community. I've said so many words over the past few years and, and I know that the, if it were a stock, the per word value is at an all time low at this <laughs> point. Um, but. Um, we're about to release something that is very substantial um, and, and it does both quantitatively and qualitatively radically improve the experience of KSB2. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Great. Well, Nate, until next time. <laughs> Thank you, man. No worries. Great. Uh, curiosity? <laughs> well, I was going to like leave the shot. Oh, it was like this beautiful moment that you've now interrupted. Oh, I've got no. a dead leg actually. <laughs> oh, no. So that pretty much wraps the video up. I hope you found it interesting and hopefully informative as well. I really appreciate Nate and the Intercept team for giving me this opportunity and he was a really good sport. A lot of those questions I'm sure weren't easy to hear asked. I plan to make more videos covering not just the KSB science update but also my trip to Germany to Space Crate Day 2023 as a whole. I got lots of fun footage from the event and I think I should be able to craft some fun stuff for you to watch. If I haven't already done that, that is. If I get a chance this week, I might manage to get a KSP science mode footage analysis video up before this video goes live, but I literally just landed back in the UK today, so it's been a bit of a whirlwind. But yes, thank you again to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring today's video. Check the links below to get your discounts. Big thanks to Nate and the team for answering all of my questions. Big thanks to my Patreon supporters and channel members, names to the left there. And of course, thank you for watching this video.